You just wanted to walk out. Um, I have a background in marketing, but right now I'm a realtor. I focus on like residential, so I'm hoping to just learn more about um, commercial and maybe investing some things myself as I'm a yeah. My name is Laura. I'm currently a paralegal. I did. I've had done some um, real estate work with title companies. I work with title companies, and I've done. I was a mortgage broker for like two years, like right before the crash. How was that? So, I mean, I learned a lot. And we did it. What I was doing was condo conversions. Like, I was doing loans for the condo conversions, uh, mostly in Pembroke County. And, um, I mean, I, I did learn it. It made some money, but then it stopped. Like, you know, it was subprime most of it. So, it was really bad. <laughs> so, That's then I, I pretty much went back to being a paralegal. <laughs> it was between that and, you know, I've always done legal work. But in between, my mom's a realtor, so she said, you know, help me out. I, I need, you know, to do loans. So I helped her out with the loans until they stopped. So then I went back to party and that's what I've been doing. But I like, I've always liked real estate and I do like the finance part of it. Um, I, I'm not a finance major at all. So that I, I want to learn more about that. I, I just don't know where I'm going with the degree. I'm still learning this my second semester. It's a great base. I mean, yeah. the investment, especially in the real estate finance, if you haven't taken the course, I would say that that is that is the, the, the backbone of a career in real estate. If you're in the commercial side of it, I mean, you can understand the development side of it, the leasing side of it, the management side of it, but the finance, I would say, is, is what kind of brings it all together. Because you have to evaluate all those pieces to be able to understand really the finance component of it, especially the investment. They go hand in hand, obviously. That's why these back to back. And Justin Velez, this is my third semester. Uh, my background is engineering, civil engineering, and I have a degree in urban planning as well. Uh, about a year ago, I actually switched to commercial real estate. Uh, I want to get into land development. So this program is oh, just learning as much as I can and then try to create a career path from there. Currently, I work for a land commercial uh, firm in um, Delray Beach. I'm the director of marketing. And I have a gentleman that was mentoring me as well. And like I said before, I'm just trying to learn as much as I can, especially in the financing part, because this is all new. Good morning, my name is Dustin Anderson. I'm a general contractor. Uh, this is my last semester in the program. Um, I want to be uh, a commercial developer uh, and kind of get away from building for other people and build for myself. My background is mainly residential uh, on the develop, I mean on the construction side. Uh, our commercial jobs are, are uh, we do some interior build outs and restoration work, but it's uh, mainly residential. So this program's really opened my eyes up to the commercial property. I wear that residential head. Yeah, it's a different scale, but uh, I was telling you, man, there's, there's some, some, doing it on your own account is, is certainly going to be a, a, a much bigger wealth creator. Yeah. Uh, through those opportunities. So, uh, I'm uh, Tyler Kitson. Um, this is my third quarter, I guess you could call it. Right? Um, currently working for uh, a developer who's based out of West Palm Beach, but they have brought me over to get involved in pretty much all aspects of land development over in Naples. So I'm in Naples right now. Um, and uh, just trying to take away as much knowledge as, I, knowledge as I can throughout this program in order to um, advance my career and, and help me move up. Who's the um, developer, by the way? Uh, Kitsina Partners. Okay. My name is Alyssa Schachter. This is my last semester in the program. I'm currently working for JLL as an intern, um, and I'm transitioning when I graduate into local market research analyst for Broward and Long Beach County office markets. Um, at JLL? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, so I'll be starting that at the end of the June when I'm done here, and then potentially get to the development side of things, but I want to learn the market better first. Get the minor in PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if you see PowerPoints, they're stupid. They make everyone look really bad. 
right? So everyone wants you on their upcoming group projects presentation. Outsource them. I'm paying them. Yeah, the syllabus is going to evolve a little bit more too, and I'll get to it because we're going to do some more case studies and some group work, um, determining opportunities, presenting opportunities, a little, a little competition. Awesome. My name is Alex. Uh, I work in investment sales down in Miami. I work for uh, one of these. And I uh, do a lot of 31 exchanges, uh, also do residential sales. And hopefully with this program, I'll get to learn more of the development side, maybe make a jump into the commercial sector. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. You know, maybe a little uh, college apartment housing on the uh, west coast of Florida, something like that. Student uh, housing, huh? Yeah. Jackson, uh, I'm a realtor, jack of all trades, um, master of nuts. <coughs> uh, this is like my fifth, sixth term, I think it's four, my fourth term. Uh, and I want to learn as much as I can. Uh, I want to develop my own project. I'm thinking of starting off with like a mobile home community with some acres of land that we have in the country. I want to start off something like that. But I want to much knowledge as I can and become a developer one day. Yeah, mobile home parks, it, just the sleeper of all yeah. investments. Unbelievable.
is different, and the money is there, be sure. I came last week, and in the middle, yes, the money is in South America, and the people got here to preserve the, the money, only for this. Mm. But the profit is there. It's my well, yeah, most people do it for a yeah, profit. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, That's the goal. Some people say it's another reason why. Yeah. yeah. But the, the Goldfarb oh, family, yeah. the Goldfarb yeah. family that started the Costco is uh, is here, right? Isn't the gold the Goldfarb family that started uh, that the Costco? Oh, yeah. Yes, I know that. Yeah. They're because here. They are, yeah, they are. Uh, yes. Uh, Dan, you know Dan? Uh, Egal. Uh, one of the uh, family yeah. was, uh, went to the school with my daughter. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Well, yeah, you have a connection here in Bay Harbor. Yeah, that's what they're close to them. Okay. Yeah. Good. My name is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Really, really. People who invest here, you can say. I know from Argentina. Argentina, <coughs> I'm sure that I know them. Because okay. I work with them all my life. Perfect. Rough. My name is uh, Ben Marcello. Uh, I'm here to learn whether I want to enroll in your course. Uh, Hi, Ben. I did it. Uh, I uh, got an MBA from Columbia University in New York uh, many years ago uh, when Columbia didn't have a real estate program at all. Uh, for 35 years, I owned a real estate brokerage, real estate school, real estate investment company in Newport, Rhode Island, and sold that uh, three, four years ago. So at the moment, I'm a board snooper. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm fascinated with South Florida, obviously. And um, so I'm pretty close to pulling the trigger to enroll in this class. And I'm also interested in the finance side. And uh, FAU has an investment, financial investment program. If I do it, I'll do both. So I have a financial analysis back combined with. And if you do both, you're not going to be there for it. Um, You're not going to be a board snowbird anymore, I don't think, if you do that either at the same well, time. Well, what you've been saying, this is uh, very fascinating so far. You guys are doing a great job. Just from uh, is Brian, Elena, Anthony, Juan, or Chadwick? Did it, I didn't know. Anthony's supposed to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Please don't. I didn't know if they were, because the first class, can you still drop this or no? I think so, you can still drop it. Still an ad drop? Robert, any news with the AC? Yeah, yeah, they, they turned it on. We'll be comfortable in 30 minutes. Oh, they turned it on, they decided to turn it on. Yes, it's really nice. Thank thing. you so much. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. I don't change we my will, shirt. Uh, we'll be comfortable in 30 minutes. Okay. All right. okay. They were like, oh, you guys are up there. Yeah. <laughs> I should have to call somebody, and somebody had to push it out. <coughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 One of them. It's Mark. Matt. Matt, I'm sorry. Yeah. I missed the introduction. I, I, sorry. I met you last term, but uh, yeah. is this your first time teaching? What, what? Your, I didn't hear your skill. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is that my first No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear your background. I didn't hear your background. That's all. I, I met you last term. Yes. With, uh, yep. Presentation. Yes. Yeah. And actually, uh, use some of that knowledge the next class. The 4040 uh, term you were telling us about. Yep. Yeah, and we'll go into it. Chapter 12 gets into all that too. Um, so, um, yeah, since the last class, uh, I was hired as an adjunct professor um, here at NOVA. And so, yes, this is my first official class. Can you hear me back there too? Not at all. <laughs> That's why I'm talking so loud, man. Awesome. He always yells. <laughs> That's not why. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, all right. So um, yeah. So I joined uh, as an adjunct professor since the last class. I, that was just kind of like a guest lecture, and then they asked me to see if I could be more involved. Um, so I'll be kind of spearheading this class as well as the finance class, uh, the next quarterly term, I guess it would be. Um, but uh, yeah, 37. Been in the business for 15 years. Um, Primarily on the finance side has been my history. Um, 
kind of fixed rate mortgages, MES, preferred equity investments, um, with um, a couple of investment banks, some that are still alive, some that are not, uh, based down here. And um, uh, since about 2008, got full time into launching Biscayne Asset Management, which is my wholly owned company, uh, to invest in preferred equity um, uh, and JV equity opportunities. Um, so my full time job is really capital markets. Uh, I do passive investing with great developers. Um, I refuse to build anything just because of the risks involved and the timing of it. I'd rather be able to buy something right, maybe a little bit more value-oriented uh, type of investor. Um, and so yeah, that, that's probably just from my own just comfort if I can evaluate a, a great piece of existing real estate. Um, some people pride themselves on being able to credit themselves. I'm just not that guy, it's not my background. Um, but I mean, there's incredible yield to be had there and pride of ownership knowing that you probably built it better than maybe somebody else could, maybe some other GC or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, and then on Saturday, so I'm gonna be involved with this. So, I mean, I, I, again, I, I have zero academic perspective in the industry. And um, you know, I think I'll be able to expand on, on and want to kind of apply a lot more of what you're reading in the chapters versus just trying to regurgitate. Um, I also speak, I went to Babson College, a small business school outside of uh, Boston, um, and I go back and teach there, MIT, and, and now here, so, yeah. Matt, does your investment firm invest only in real estate? Yes. Or do you invest in uh, liquid instruments? Uh, we hedge against <coughs> corporate bonds and REITs. And so I look at, if I can buy a public anchor shopping center, <clears throat> I can buy, you know, Publix is actually a poor example because they're a private company, um, but we'll offset the hedge of that anchor risk, buying, you know, if Publix were to offer corporate bonds, uh, we would buy the bonds as well. Um, so, and I also have a pretty good size REIT portfolio as well. So, again, passive investment, with experts that do this all day long with critical mass leasing management in-house, internally managed REITs. Um, that's uh, you know, the alternative to actually here, that arbitrage, you know, to, yeah. to be able to have a different type of exit um, with the liquidity. So uh, I can't manage it day in and day out, but I can sell it day in and day out, so. Uh, one question, how much you know, not saying personally, but how much would it take somebody that, how much money would you need to buy like REITs and stuff that you're talking about? Is it you just like a stock? A regular yeah, stock exactly. Store? So, I mean, you could go buy Simon Property Group for the biggest global mall owner in the world, you know, obviously in the world, global here in the world, um, for $192 a share. Okay, so is, is your strategy to have some liquidity in yes. it? As liquidity and fixed. Yes. Still taking real estate exposure, but more risk than a treasury or a CD. Right. You know, in terms of risk return. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any background in finance, but I was just uh, thinking you've mentioned Simon a couple of times. Simon has made their money lately from the outlet malls, right? Yeah. They just signed a contract with. Uh, Jason Bailey, whatever. Sears. Sears. So how are they going to justify that to the investors? When, you know, I I'm, I'm think that I'm, I'm going to invest in that, in these uh, REITs. I'm going to, they're not uh, very attractive uh, REITs to buy. Are they? But they're starting to promote now to get things back on the wall. Really? Yeah. So the, the question is, uh, I've mentioned Simon Property Group, who is a great retail mall benchmark in the industry for developers, owners, managers, leasing. Um, they're the 800 pound gorilla, and, and you know, they're trying to buy Mesa Ridge right now. They just went in for a, for a $5.6 billion bid on them. They just did a sale lease back with Sears. The Sears is trying to be able to realize more equity. Um, 
So actually, that's one of my examples, kind of as we get really dive into the taxation side of it. <clears throat> um, so they ultimately want to control the real estate. So if they can go in there, help Sears with a short-term <coughs> liquidity issue, I think they raised a hundred and. $80 million plus from 182 and there's 10 locations that are already serviced by Simon Balls. So like the Aventura Sears is not actually owned by Simon and Turnberry. Sears owns that location themselves. I don't know if it's part of the portfolio, but ultimately they're gonna reinvent that whole Sears into a two-story mini mall itself. So if Simon wants to control that and they want to be able to uh, influence, well, you know, one of the top five uh, operating malls in the country. Price per square foot. You're gonna say something. No, I just didn't okay. know that information. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's it's more of they want to be able to have <laughs> the REIT taxation structure. So ninety percent plus has to be released to. Um, invest to shareholders so you don't have to pay corporate taxes on that um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit easier of a way to contribute that into a REIT structure as an up REIT so you're not paying capital gains against that sale to Simon and then Sam, Simon will be able to inject CapEx money for taxation purposes that Sears does not have to be able to ultimately grow the venture. So yeah that's it that was actually an up REIT. So their outlet side of it, can you hear me better? You said upreit? Upreit. U-P-R-E-I-T. So basically uh, contributed real estate for operating shares. Mm -hmm. So um, now, now they got those shares basically, those preferred shares in Simon and avoided having to pay capital gains tax. They have now uh, no depreciation that they're gonna be, because they're not actually the, the owners of the real estate anymore. Um, but uh, again, they were able to raise very, very cheap equity, basically is what it came down to, to try to be able to reinvent the operations at their other stores that they still, still own. So they own operation. Just trying to be able to re <coughs> release themselves of pent up equity. You know, they, they own all that free and clear, basically. There's no mortgages against any of those Sears locations that they're contributing. So, um, so if they were to sell those, their cost basis is so low that their taxable event would have been just disgusting. Oh, right. So instead, so they were able to. Yeah, I'm selling the property because uh, I saw a K-9 the same like Sears. <coughs> yeah. And uh, in North Miami, I saw that Aldi is uh, well, like in the middle of Whole Foods and the public that kind, but it's for Australia. The capital, and they are building uh, one store in the parking lot just near the Cayman. Yep. In the Biscayne and 100. Yep. 100 yeah. Yep. And they sold this city. The, this is a strategy? Well, that Kmart is not owned by Kmart. No. There's a third party owner. Uh, okay. you know, Tyler could own the Kmart fee simple interest in the real estate. Um, so basically, the developer there. Uh, had an extraordinary amount of land. Yeah. There's a much better higher, you know, I would call that a higher and better use of, of that than of that dirt than a Kmart. Um, I don't know who owns the real estate, uh, but they were able to, because they had so much excessive parking, uh, they were able to carve out and, build, and develop in the out parcel, it's called an Aldi. So instead of selling in that case because I think Kmart's only paying like two dollars a foot in rent. I mean it's just it's just dirt cheap, it's nothing. Um, so yeah, to be able to capture the higher and better use of that of that real estate. And Aldi's is a great operator. I mean it's a, it's a really, really solid hmm? What's that? Aldi's just it's new to something. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I saw because last year I went to Australia and uh, they are leaders in the, uh, in the market yeah. in Australia. And I said, what is this? It's just near the one, one, one uh, store with the other. And uh, they use this parking lot. Oh, 
But yeah, so we, yeah, when but <clears throat> when you have such a low cost basis like that, I mean your 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 hands are a little bit tied because most developers do not want to sell because they don't want to pay taxes. I mean that's just the to be able to enjoy cash flow, the ability to refinance, take cash out, still maintain ownership, still employ your employees. You know, once once you have a portfolio of a good size, I mean that example Kmart. Is a triple net lease, so you don't need <coughs> anybody to help you. You just collect the rent check. Everything is their responsibility. Right. Um, but if you've owned that for a, a, a while and it's so cheap and, and you, you can't lever it up, that um, it's impossible. You're trying to avoid as much of a tax. You know, tax Thirty-nine percent goes to the government if you don't exchange into something else. I mean, that's yeah. just. Because I mean, again, you're you're most of that's assuming that you're in the highest tax bracket, right? For for uh, for tax gains. So Matt, uh, my question is outside the realm of today's class. I don't understand what you have. Let's talk about it after. Just just so because we want to be able to dive in a little bit further. But if you, I mean, let's um, let's jump into the books then really fast. Uh, does everyone have a copy of it actually of the textbook? I think some people didn't have it, maybe. You don't have it. Uh, you have it. Who does not? That you can maybe pair up. Yeah, yeah. It's evolving. You're not, uh, it's basically chapter like 11 through 17. It's getting better, don't you feel it? Well, back is not dripping anymore. You're going to share your fan? <laughs> Well, let's just kind of start, just kind of, uh, we'll, just, we'll pick on Dustin really fast here, since you're already a contractor and you're already developing, and there's reasons why you're developing, all right? So basically this chapter 11 is going to kick off, we're going to, we're going to tackle a chapter basically every, uh, every session. Um, and so here, it's basically saying, what's our, what's our opportunity, is, if there is an opportunity, uh, let's quant qualify it, quantify it, and then uh, assuming we're going to sell it, you know, is your is your uh, is your best case scenario. Okay, we won't talk about how you can or what your alternatives to selling are, you know, or if you do sell, what's the alternative to paying taxes? Let's just kind of go by the book. Again, we're going to have two exams. Um, they're going to be pretty meaty percentages of overall grade as well. Um, kind of kind of keep it short. You know, they'll probably be hour, hour and a half long ones, but I want to be able to, you know, at least be able to tackle these basics. Does anybody, before we dive into it, does anybody have any specific questions on the, this is pretty straightforward math, you know, in terms of the taxation side of it, um, which we will get into, but I want to just, if, if there's anything in advance that we can, uh, you know, does anybody have questions on from the reading that, you just want to be able to clarify before we start talking about it that would help because I don't want to have anybody get lost as we start going into it but please ask you know I can't stress enough just ask a million questions I mean, this is the only way you learn the business the book is only 10% of the knowledge base you know pretty much uh, in the sector yeah can you explain the difference between passive income and active income um, so uh, I'm trying to think of the best example. The book, I don't really even like the book's example of it. Um, what, what page are you on right now? 370. Okay, so these are losses 
um, relating to, or, or could be potential losses, that's how I look at it, but really when's only gonna go into play. One's gonna be more on the operating level side of it, which is gonna be your active. Um, I think it just notes kind of those uh, expenses related to the property, uh, versus to the operation versus the passive that are gonna be related to the sale of it. So when you're out of, when you're kind of out of the deal. So um, from, a, from a tax reporting perspective, um, your passive is going to be just because you had, I think, I think it only references like salaries and really kind of overhead based items are going to be the past ones that you're going to be able to, uh, it's going to affect your taxable, uh, your tax, taxable income. Okay, so if you just pay people way too much money, then uh, you're going to have probably a negative taxable income potentially. Um, very similar to the example on the quiz. You know, it was just that totally out of whack, over leveraged situation um, that probably has way too much overhead because the expenses were like a half a million dollars on a million dollars of income, right? I mean, that's that's a that's kind of a failing project. Um, or you're probably better ramping up um, your your top line revenues to kind of match a very heavy expense load. So if we call this this a shopping center your percentage of expenses against EGI probably in the mid 30s is probably over, you know not 50%. So either you're preparing for a big ramp up on top line um, or you just don't want to have uh, you know, any any taxable income for that given year which is just, exactly which is that tax shelter yeah exactly which goes into um, a whole another set of motivations you know for for ownership um, or you just have your entire family on the payroll uh, so, which which happens ever so often as well. So, um, but no, I guess, well, you know, uh, Dustin, we'll just take the resi example and we'll apply it as if you were a contractor who was identifying a, uh, a mobile home park. So we'll, we'll get Frederick in this too. Can you hear me? Okay. There's nothing to build in a mobile home park though. So you just back the truck. <laughs> 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 you just put the, the power. Yeah, you gotta put the pads. On. Yeah, true. true. And the pad, pads and infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Not vertical. <laughs> Nothing vertical. You're only. You want to own some units? You can, but you're only gonna a get a clubhouse or something. Uh, yeah. A clubhouse, nice pool, nice pool. shuffleboard. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Must. Uh, must. Yeah. <laughs> But, I mean, I guess what you want to be able to do is, okay, just from an investment perspective, you want to be very, very, uh, uh, call it kind of value in, uh, investing uh, on that space. So you own the land, right? And it's pretty, it's infrastructure and paths. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a very intense development. And it's zoning. And zoning. For you. I learned in this country that zoning is very important because if you want to build something at the zoning, you have to build, you can develop your Then you're not building anything. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So zoning is before actually the land. It's exactly. residential zone. Is that where they go? Yeah, the permit zoning. Hi. Okay. What? Are you, are you? I'm uh, visiting you, so I'm sorry. Okay, good deal. Well, Thank you. Um, I just didn't know if you were late. Yeah, quiz zero. Quiz zero. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Wait, okay. um, but yeah, so I think the examples in the book are all for purchases. But we'll take a we'll take a, a step back and so your total uh, cost because I mean, we'll, we want to incorporate cost basis in this too. So your total cost for zoning for permits, the land, uh, and then, you know, say it's three million bucks. They're pretty cheap to, uh, to build and to, to maintain. Um, what, what, Dustin, what, when you look at an opportunity, what are the first, what are the first kind of things that go through your, through your mind? I'm not going to tease you into uh, an I'm answer, just like but I just want something. Gross income that can produce. Yep. And what else? Because uh, well, that's only top line. Top line, I mean, look at your, you know, your construction, your development costs. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll say it's three million bucks. Okay. 
So outside of that, you know, get, dive in a, in a little bit more. So you just mentioned EGI. Yeah, operating so expenses. Expenses. Yeah, just kind of like do like mark, you know, compare market rents and just yep. kind of like a little feasibility on, or do backwards, or, you know, what I, I, yeah, you can work it backwards and do like a, a front door, back door kind of approach and, and decide, you know, what your acquisition costs would be on the land or if you already own it, how much you can do in development costs. You always back into it. And I say always 99% of the time because you ultimately want to know what's my basis going to be? Can I, can I sell it? after I build it. Mm -hmm. um, is somebody gonna you know, want it to be able to re you know, realize some IRR for yourself? Right. 15, 20 yeah. percent, you know, you gotta be able to sell it for close to $4 million, you know, right out of the gates. So that's without having to take into uh, ordinary income, because you might have just built it and you had it for owned it for less than a year. So you're gonna be paying, paying through the nose. You know, but, you, but I mean, usually when you, it's a question. Usually, when you uh, when you're looking at a development opportunity, you don't really take tax tax advantages or disadvantages other than if it's a 1031. You, that really doesn't factor into your investment decision, does it? Always. Yeah, you do. Yes. Always. Because I mean, that's kind of like a given. I mean, you know, you're going to have. Yeah. It's got to work. Whether you get well, it work if you don't get tax. Like you're not going to move forward with it. Yes, no, but if you have no interest in ever owning it long term, like you don't want to collect rents. You don't want to deal with maintenance issues. Um, it's going to be ordinary income, it's, or it's going to be capital gains. So if you're a merchant builder and you just built this great park, uh, there's big consequences in that. You're always going to have to consider that. Yeah, if you have. You're actually paying some more money that, that you made on the, on the project. Maybe not on an IRR standpoint, but on a. POM. Yes. Well, yeah, this is not even considered IRR because you're just going to be merchant building right, this. So. I guess what I'm really driving back at, yeah, is it is a kind of, sorry, were you going to say something? Is that backdoor approach. It's it's what's my what's my cost basis going to be? Um, your, to your point, feasibility. <clears throat> Can I rent it? Is there supply demand? Am I surrounded by existing parks? What else is going around here? You know, are there other paths that are cheaper? Um, and, and I get, go along with cheaper with the market rents big driver, whether you're going to buy it, whether you're going to build it. What is everybody else doing with me? Is everything really, really old and the market rents are really low because everything's just so inferior and you're going to come in and build the nicest park with that clubhouse, with you know the shuffleboard. That's, just, that's a huge, huge uh, <laughs> demand for everything. Exactly. But no, so I want to, I think all of that's going to take into consideration your whole period, how you're going to get taxed. Um, the market rents cost basis are, are huge determining factors. So you want to lay all that, yeah. And demographic as well. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think. If you have a consumer or your project, the demographic, which is your target? Um, Because you have to have a target related to the project, it will not work. 100%. Yeah, I mean, that's so part of your feasibility. As well. Yeah, it, it's either. It's not numbers. Yes. So quantifying it and qualifying it are, are, are very, very significant. Do people want to even live here? Do people, do people want to go to work in this office building if it's located um, <clears throat> you know, in the Everglades? Probably not. I mean, because you don't have the feasibility to cover it and no one wants to live out there. They don't, well, not everybody. but. I mean, this yeah. is where the local part of that comes in, I, I would guess. Because uh, this particular piece of land is uh, in a small rural area. Mm -hmm. So I would think you would have to get like a market survey or something done by the local, local people in that area. Yep, all part of the feasibility. But I guess what I want to focus more on is, is what you're looking at and right. kind of qualifying I mean, that up front. To, uh, you know, it's, it's a piece of land that's in a very tertiary location. I mean, probably not a lot of uses for that, maybe, um, but maybe there is a mobile home park that would be a perfect fit. Um, if you can get these rents, so you want to be able to have comps that you can make sure you're going to be you know, within market rents, that you have potential, that you, have, that you are creating some real value. 
um, to, to justify putting a shovel in the ground or justify writing a check to buy something. And then it's ultimately, you know, how can you get out of it? And how quickly? So what are, what are the consequences of that development effort for um, the hard equity purchase and no effort? So, um, but uh, <coughs> going back to, you know, kind of just the, the uh, Development type. What else? What else would you probably want to be able to consider as you're as you're really trying to identify an opportunity? Future improvements, additions, yeah. accessibility, transportation. Yeah. Yeah. So, Tyler, go on with that kind of. I mean, a little bit more about the future opportunity. Whether it's value add or whether it's something that's all, you know tip top ready to go. I mean, going along with you know expenses future expenses, um, upkeep, things like that. You know, how the history of it related to the rental rates or related to, you know, any kind of. Yeah, so I, I, the, the, that value add right there is um, you just having that knowledge, you know, knowing where, where that market rent is that, or maybe you have Aldi in your back pocket, you know, the regional manager or something like that you're like okay I'm gonna buy this with a vacant 20,000 square foot box there because I'm gonna buy it at 60 bucks a foot throw an Aldi with a new 10-year triple net lease and then all of a sudden you just create a significant amount and that's and then it's it can happen within 12 months you know I mean, uh, uh, that, that would be the taxation of that is uh, it, it could be but then you're going to probably put some debt on it. You know, probably try to leverage it a little bit. Um, you know, have, have you guys chatted? I guess in the finance class, you know, where where would be kind of the appropriate debt levels? Um, you know, probably for an IRR. You know, mid-teen IRR is a big. I, I would say is a is a common common hurdle you know, to try to get to you know, for a, a commercial property. Um, Not always the case. I mean, certainly there's been stuff that's been 20, 30 percent that's come out of the recession, just because people are buying stuff on auction.com, buying it from special servicers. Um, those the opportunities can be you know, realized significantly. But you know, those cost bases again are so low, like the Kmart uh, example that you know you don't know. You want to own it probably for more, just slightly more than a year, you know, just to be able to get into into the long term, the long term capital. Um, has anybody participated in anything that was for sale, you know, outside of the residential side of it? Has anyone participated in like a commercial sale? At all? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, not all the times, but I have participated in the past. Uh, Representing the seller. The seller. Yeah. And so, what were the motivations for the seller? This guy was just old, and he's owned it for like thirty years, <laughs> and he just wanted to get out of it. But he owned it. A, a buyer's dream. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he was uh, he owned his businesses in the, in the Governor Grove, and so he built all the building himself uh, to run his businesses. And uh, he sold this company off about ten years ago. Uh, I was still in college, and I worked with my dad at the time, uh, so he had the sale of it. And he was just uh, he was just a little more the rid of it. Wasn't really any business uh, what an informational sale. Gotcha. And it sold pretty quickly because he was uh, he didn't really care as much about. It. Made enough money off the building leasing in the past, and he built it for nothing about 30 years ago. So it's all pretty clean. Yeah. Um, you probably didn't see the settlement statement for the sale, did you? I didn't personally. I, I probably did get off. No, that's not necessary. But I'm. It, it's a, a point that I want to chat about. It's really just kind of more of the motivations around the industry too. You know, a guy. He's owned it forever, probably owes nothing on it, and zero cash, ba cash basis, doesn't want to, uh, can't or doesn't want to probably uh, have an estate plan you know, for the asset where, uh, where there's a, tra a much cheaper transfer of that, because you'd be probably shocked into what his, his taxable basis would be on that thing. This is probably the highest rate. Yeah, I mean it's thirty nine percent. Yeah, I mean 
uh, let's let's talk about the motivations of somebody who wants to pay almost forty percent of their af you know, after sale proceeds to to the government. Um, you know, doesn't really happen all that often uh, if you can help it. Um, and there's a lot of strategies that go around into you know, some of those those motivations. I think the book kind of talks about a couple of them. Um, nothing in, in much detail, but uh, but yeah, I mean there's sickness, there's, I don't care about it anymore. Um, you also see that I've just made so much money that uh, that it doesn't really make a difference. But I would say the bigger one most recently is that um, maybe cap rates are as good as they're going to get. And everyone knows how to calculate the cap rate, right? Am I speaking of curve? What's that? Yeah. Curve? Curve. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good my name's Matt. Yeah. No, that's not her. That's not Mark. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's so it's historically low cap rates. It's access to debt again for a buyer, um, and 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 realizing that it might not be as good as it's going to get right now. So that's maybe actually another motivation too is I'll take the tax hit because I can probably get a few million dollars more out of it today than I probably could have five years ago. And so if I just, the weight probably is offset, offsetting a little bit of the, of the taxable situation. Um, also, um, yeah, there's, Probably, I mean, going a little bit to some of my clients too on the on the taxation side of it, um, and we'll go back to Simon just because well, you mentioned it, but uh, Simon Property Group. But basically, it, as you get big enough and scalable enough, the last thing you want to do is pay taxes. I mean, that 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 in that in real estate is like the worst case scenario if you really have patient equity. And I say patient equity because um, maybe some of the home builders in here or realtors, you'll realize that it's a, it's a different, uh, well, it's a different tax process altogether or taxable value altogether. Whether you're married, whether you're, you know, you're single and how much you can sell and profit that you can realize before you have to pay the government. But, um, it's, uh, you really want to be able to sell it as quickly as you possibly can, right? So everyone can make a commission and then you can recycle those funds. You want to be able to have the ability in commercial to recycle the funds into the CapEx, into, uh, you know, again, that's going to only increase your basis. It's only going to uh, lower your taxable, taxable basis, okay? You want to be able to invest as much money as you possibly can on only capital goods. Everyone's... Give me some examples of capital stuff. I know you guys, on the finance side, you probably didn't go into it, but the capital and nature items are roof and structure. Capital uh, expenses. Capital expenses, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, those are all going to be extremely valuable. As much as it hurts to write a $400,000 check for a new roof on a shopping center, I mean, that's only increasing your, your cost basis in the property in the sale. But again, most developers, most owners aren't looking at it as it's only going to be you know, lowering my taxable basis or how much I'm going to have to pay tax-wise. Um, but the reinvestment is is, uh, is a huge advantage to the longer you own it, obviously, the depreciation, which is very, very nice to have. Most developers that have an, at least a small portfolio rarely pay any income taxes. I mean, uh, I can't remember in the last few years, especially clients' tax returns that I've seen that they've they, they paid any taxes at, at all. Yeah. So like, money back. I mean, what, what goes on? No, it's all it's all they losses. To, yeah, that's all lost carry forward. So transfer ordinary income to capital gains. Uh, that, but it's also um, depreciation. It's mortgage interest. It's. Um, oh, yeah, it's it's like it's all those capital expenses. Uh, it's recapture when you sell it. Uh, yes, you hope. That's the intent. Yeah. The depreciation is temporary because when you sold the property, it's it's temporary. It's a deduction. 
But when you sold the property, you need to look after. Yeah. It's not that you, you don't need to pay for this. It's in your time. Well, time can... When you sign, you need to recapture the, the, the condition. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, either you have time or you don't. Yeah. And so you're, there's all the different motivations of, do you, do you want to wait? Do you want to realize exactly. more income? Is there more upside in the property? Or you want to manage, and uh, there are some that they build and they sell, and they want to manage all that. They need all the money for the management of the property. It's good. It's good money. Some want this. Other want an thing. Yes, they are different. Right, so it's all going to be in your motivation. It goes back to motivation. Do you want to have, if you can get an offer for a million dollars more than you built it for, and you can realize a, a, you know, an interesting IRR for yourself, do it. Now, but what's your tax? Are you going to pay 20% of tax? Are you going to pay, if you're the right. highest, you're going to pay 39. I mean, so it, it, you have to always, like I said, kind of backdoor into where where your motivations are. Do you want to make a million dollars or do you want to collect management fees? You know, do you want to get out of into capital gains? Just wait a little bit longer, recycle your, your equity into, into something else. Um, Let's yeah. say if you want to uh, replace a roof, the parking lot, uh, arrangement or something, all that is deductible from the taxes? Please. It increases your basis. It increases your basis, yes. Um, yeah. But you can deduct like the roof repair or uh, well, it's depreciated. Depreciated. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's not going to go direct to your bottom line, or or everybody would do it, you know. But yeah, there's going to be portions that are going to be deducted. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's. I mean, it's, that's one of the biggest benefits of long-term ownership is you want to be able to hold it, hold it on, uh, hold on to the property, be able to create what you can. You know, you're having a loan for that. There's a loan sometimes to that too, right? The interest. The interest. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, it's recommended to make a loan for a profit? Uh, again, yeah. it's motivations. Uh, okay. Janae, you're, you had the worst case yeah. you know, scenario example of, of times are good, values are up, uh, top, you know, height of the market, 2007 rents. Um, you refinance on that level. Some people lost their property in 2011 because vacancies increased, rents plummeted, you know, the market just kind of gets a little bit messy every cycle or two, you know. So, um, but, but over leveraging is, it, you want to have moderate lever leverage, I would say. I think I said earlier, you know, it's, there's, there's good leverage. There's a very, very good leverage. Now it's all of what you can stomach and it's all of what you're going to do with the savings of that. The interest more uh, being able to deduction is, is, is huge for your taxable income. Um, but uh, you don't want to get over your skis, as they say. Right? So I mean, a lot of people today will say, I've got increasing rents. I've got a good basis. There's growth in rents. That maybe there's some management efficiencies. I can plug in my management team, and they cost three percent, not five, to a third party that maybe a seller had. Um, and then getting seventy-five percent financing. You know, that's too much. Huh? It's all what you can stomach. It's all of what you can stomach. So if you have, if you have that that knowledge in the sector, and you have. Uh, a, 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 lot, a, a pretty solid commitment, 75% non-recourse, no personal guarantee leverage, sounds really enticing. Um, but the sensitivity to rents declining, the sensitivity to lots of, lots of supply in the apartment market right now too, Fannie and Freddie, unnecessarily aggressive right now you know, for apartment lending. Non-recourse, 80% leverage. It's like the apartment market's just never going to fail us ever again. <laughs> it's right around the corner because everybody's building apartments. I mean, it's just oversupply. There's going to be tons of over development. Oh, well, some and the developers will say no, no, no. I can get two more deals out of the or two more projects out of the ground, and there'll be still more people who are 
who are still going to come and kind of rent out places because uh, they still can't qualify for a home. The majority of people is like just buying for, for rental. So they buy invest and they just rent it. Yeah. yeah. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. so and the apartments? That's too risky for the apartments. It depends. Okay. It depends. I mean, if you're uh, the Camden apartment building right here, mm -hmm. it's probably one of the most successful apartment projects in the last decade, you know, in South Florida. Infill locations, the expenses are very high, but the rents are very high, but you can't ask for better access. Um, and they're a publicly traded REIT that owns it, so you know, they're not looking to ever sell it. They don't have to unless they're just offered something ridiculous. But um, they're, they're, the, the room to grow rents, the ability to, you know, there's no supply really downtown of that scale that's going to have the luxuries that it has. So maybe you want to put 75% financing on that property. But if you don't have to, I would never advise it. Because um, a lot of people lost their properties. But then again, at 10 year financing, there's no personal guarantees on it either. When you go and get a Fannie and Freddie multifamily loan. So if there's a prop there if there's a problem there, or if you're over leveraged or you know, heaven forbid something very bad goes at a property, you know, goes wrong and no one wants to live there anymore, all you gotta do is throw back the keys. Mm -hmm. So um, that's your you know, that's the safety net on the other side is that the debt can be so uh, flexible in that if times go bad, I can either sell it and try to milk as much or try to own it, refinance it, max proceeds, and just run it as long as I possibly can until the market blows up or you know or sell a little bit earlier and let somebody else take that risk. You know, that, that, that's significant. But there's always a little bit, oh well, there's very good debt in, in real estate. Very, very good debt. You know, to the property, to the returns, to your Certainly, the like it's like just keep it and, and pass the, side, the real estate cycles and like somehow. Why would you keep it? Why would you want to keep it? Like in a recession, I won't sell it. I just keep it with a with a with a tenant at the lowest price I can hold it. Mm -hmm. So at least I can receive something to cover my mortgage. Right, and so it's back backing into the debt service coverage. You know, yeah, that, that if it passed one point two, put it away. And that's even aggressive. aggressive. I would say I, I want more than 1.2 today. 3.3. Uh, we're working on like, 1.3, 1.35. Yeah, like 135 feels really good right now. Um, usually down to a 120 is when you know it's a slippery slope after that. So if you're if you're if you're starting at a 135, you go down to a 120, usually I'm gonna structure in some cash flow sweeps. I wanna control some of that cash flow as a lender, you know, to be able to make sure that, that, they pay. that they're paying the mortgage on time um, and that they're managing it effectively. You know, if not, I'm kicking out the manager. You know, I wanna be able to control the cash flow in a lockbox. Um, yeah, that's, you know, one, one, three, five is, you know, feels really good, but, but Fannie and Freddie are doing 80% in 120. But, un and I say unnecessarily, you don't need to be that aggressive. You that. With your mobile home park. With a mobile home park, right? Yeah, maybe not 80%, but I mean, that mobile home park site is probably, like I said, it's the sleeper of asset types. You I mean, charge for shuffleboard time too. Yeah, 15, 15 bucks an hour for shuffleboard. <laughs> Great other income. Um, but, but no, I mean you have you have infrastructure risk, and you have and you have access to some of the most aggressive debt on the planet. Um, so I mean it's not it's not the sexiest of assets. It can be a paved driveway and double wides preferred, but it doesn't need a clubhouse, it doesn't need a shuffleboard, it doesn't need a pool. Actually, those are liabilities. I don't want any of that stuff. You know, some people say that those are what's creating demand, and if somebody's gonna be, or moving in, I should say, their, their mobile home, um, <coughs> that they're gonna to wanna to have access to those luxuries, but I mean, from an operational perspective, unnecessary, unnecessary. I would say I would run, wanna run that cheaper the better. It's only gonna keep people there, even though the cost of moving a trailer has doubled since 2007. So there's not a lot of 
risk there, but yeah. Would you want to own, let's say, the trailers and collect rights on that, or just own the property and have them turn around trailer? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd want to own the trail, the, the so homes the themselves. Ones. Most lenders don't want you either, because they don't want that as collateral. That's what I think. <laughs> Usually you say, okay, I'll write like 10%. Like <laughs> but you don't want to maintain, you don't want somebody, a transient person coming in and out of a trail. You can't control, you know, enough of, you know, let them own it, pay you a couple hundred bucks, a few hundred bucks a month. Um, so a lot of times that when you do residential and you and you rent, they always say don't include a refrigerator or washer and dryer because the more the people carry in, the longer they'll end up staying. So that's what we do on our residential properties. I agree with that. You don't put a don't provide washer dryer or refrigerator. The people, have to, the people have to bring it in. There's more stuff to move out, and also those are like the most common things that break. So you're not responsible for them. No. So like in the situation now where it's high demand for rentals, like you know, yeah. competition for Yeah, it's just commitment. Well, when my mom first came out of Miami, she didn't have a refrigerator in her apartment. She yeah. had to find her own. I was talking, you know, eighties or whatever back in the day. Yeah. Today I don't think you could move in without one. Like I, I think every every market rate apartment complex will have one. I think that actually is a. That's, I mean, it's a hard hard to compete when someone's got to come in with five thousand dollars worth of appliances. You know, we do single family houses like that all the time. Single family is a different beast. I mean, you'll go into for sale. Yeah, I don't think you can. Not even like brand new apartment complex like that. But. Um, I mean, yeah, it's all kind of what you invested in. You've got a, you know, Viking or a Wolf refrigerator. You're probably taking it. Uh, but uh, and people understand because they probably want to personalize it too. Right? I mean, I, I don't know how many homeowners we have in here too, but uh, you know, it's pride, cost. But how can you compete with that? I mean, it's uh, Camden is is not going to compete if you've got to move in five thousand dollars worth of appliances, uh, right? Sorry. So um, for the apartments down here, I think. That's big enough. They've gone away with that. In New York, though, you're doing that. You're, you're definitely moving in. Uh, yeah. Are uh, non-recourse loans uh, common in commercial real estate or in this area of commercial real estate? Because they're kind of foreign language from where I'm from, which is southern New England, as far as being offered non-recourse loans. Yeah. We're, we're going to get into it a lot next Saturday in chapter 12, which is focuses primarily on <clears throat> the debt and the debt capital markets and, and really being able to understand the, the best uh, kind of debt equity structure. You know, so I've used 60% LTV, we talked about 75, it's all what you can kind of stomach, but there is a pretty, a pretty good uh, you know, there's there's math that'll that'll help you you know back into what you can what you can stomach as well depending on the sensitivities of rollover and multi-tenant deals but it's not uh, it's it's a national product Fannie Freddie all the CMBS lenders they're all CM, they're all non-recourse loans for stabilized assets so and that's for apartments retail <laughs> so <laughs> anchored on anchored stabilized. Only for stabilized, yes. Not construction loans. Never, well, I shouldn't say never. Certain people would get Certain it. people, Terry Styles can get a non-recourse construction loan. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's got credit, he's got track record, builds great properties, typically very low leverage as well. I mean, he's 50, 50%, 60%. So, you know, and he's writing that equity check. So that's not implied equity, that is hard equity. That's, that's going into the deals. Um, excluding land value, typically. Sometimes so it'll be true. Personal guarantee, though. So yeah, I mean, you can usually get better price. The, the non-recourse construction loans are very expensive, though. So you have to be, you have to be motivated by, a, a, you know, institutional partner probably is your equity partner to be able to justify, you know, LIBOR plus four hundred plus, you know, plus type of spread for a non-recourse construction loan. 
But on the stabilized basis, the non-recourse is king. So. Um, Do they put like a limit on that? Like if it is recourse, like yeah, up to what your. Yeah, it's common that you'll maybe be uh, a lot of personal recourse loans, 100% recourse loans will burn off to maybe your only. Uh, it's called you know you're burning off that recourse upon construction and stabilization, you know, or or on your way towards stabilization. So if you start at 100% recourse and then it goes to 50% once you deliver, you know, you complete the project, and then maybe like it burns off the top 25 risk recourse once tenants are moving in. Once all the tenants are in, open for business, paying contractual rent, uh, that is, you have basically a stabilized deal, and uh, and it's going to convert into you know, five, seven, 10, 15, 20 year fixed rate non recourse loan. So you can actually, at that point that everything is stabilized, do you refinance through uh, Fannie or Freddie? Yep. Okay, at that point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they are, and they'll, uh, they'll it's, you know, bring it into a public REMIC offering and have third party investors that are going to buy what are basically bonds backed by income producing real estate assets, a, a pool of them. So, and we'll get into that significantly more next next Saturday. Um, but that's a, it's a big beast that we don't we don't want to have to you know, go into right now. But I, I want to be able to you know more talk about kind of the motivations going into hopefully justifying the non recourse takeout, Fannie and Freddie, and being able to uh, to take you out versus uh, versus the sale. You know, I guess what why would you want? I mean, why would you want to be able to own own something versus selling something? I mean, on the on the on the residential side of it, I mean, you just want to be able to recycle your funds, you know. So maybe some there's some equity constraints there. Um, you really can't manage homes, you know. So that's kind of a, the difference in um, you know, probably being more of a value-oriented commercial developer. I mean, the the commercial development is. I mean, a lot of people will sell, take, take the tax hit just because it's so involved. Um, I think a, a lot of the, the motivations for the sale is that you have to have a very significant organization to carry a good size commercial project and commercial portfolio. I don't know how many employees Terry has now, but I mean, he prides himself. 350, then. Yeah. I thought he said eight. No. Six one. And how one did it maybe? Three fifty. Three fifty, you said? Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. That's a lot of that's a lot of overhead. Yeah. Um you know did did anybody ask him, you know, why? Well he's got a bunch of different divisions. I know. He's so got like the investment side, he's got the construction side, management, leasing. Yeah. But he prides himself on kind of being a one stop yeah. shop. Yeah. yeah. So but um, yeah, he does manage third part his own and third parties as well, and and that's so. I think his motivation though is I can I can basically offset my own costs of my own properties doing it for somebody else. So I have the team that's going to lease my own stuff, but they're also going to do it for everybody else. You know, he's going to do it for kids, and he can do it for whoever it's going to be, and. And, and then you can justify it. You can't justify it with like 50 people. You've got to justify it with 350. And then at 350, you can say, well, then I can own it. Right? Then, I, then it's, it's an easier rationale internally to say, um, I'm going to refinance something, go to Fannie Freddie versus, you know, so I can then carry a baseline of, of income streams for feeding all the mouths in my organization, which is staggering. So the same with that I didn't mobile. realize he was that big. Yeah, that mobile home park would be the same. Like you'd have to hit a critical mass of pads for someone institutional to be interested, or a hotel. You know, a ninety-three hotel is not a is not as appealing as a hundred and ten unit hotel room because of the management cost. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, if you've got a hundred and fifty <clears throat> unit Holiday Inn Express and uh, in Kissimmee, Florida, you know, kind of on the outskirts of Disney, maybe not close to Disney, but you're kind of skirting it because there's just a million hotels up there. But if you're 
if, if, if you're the Holiday Inn Express versus like a boutique 75 unit that's on the beach in Destin, you know, different beats. You, there's, you know, there's, there's no fine line to saying it works or it doesn't, uh, you know, hold or sell or, because all the economics and the, and the demand generators are always going to be different. I mean, you could substantiate a, a four unit apartment building versus 400, you know? I mean, it's all kind of what you can, what you can stomach, what you can carry, um, your, what's your time worth? I mean, there's a, you know, there's a lot of determining factors. Um, but, but you can say, I don't want to pay the taxes because I've got all these other people. Well, I see where I'm getting with this is that you can, you can say that I want to be able to carry an organization. I have motivations for my own portfolio because I think Terry still has, you know, he's got a few million square feet that he kind of controls with partners and he's kind of the principal of. But so he can have all those same people that are going to be able to you know, justify his work versus others. You know, so that salary, pay, you know, doing everybody else's work justifies the salaries for his own people. But it's, that's, I didn't think it was 350. That's wild. That's wild. You guys want to take another quick, like, two second break and we'll wrap up? Because I think we've got like 15, 20 minutes left or something like that. As Tyler just walks back in and gets a break, it's, it's so hot in here. Is it, is it better out here? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's better. You've got to do it out there. I, just told you, I don't see it with very well. I you mentioned that a lot of your clients don't haven't paid like income taxes and what but how does that happen if they have those PAL rules? Um, I mean you you'll see big depreciation mortgage interest. Uh, many times they'll sell after basis just to be able to draw down on but how do you, if they say you can't use passive losses on other categories, or is it just a, you take a passive loss from passive category to another passive category? Yeah. Yeah. Is that how that works? Yeah, I mean, there's a guy in the Hollywood red building, mm -hmm. circle under contract, and he was going to tear it down and build condos right there. Lost the deal. Condo market otherwise couldn't carry the red building based on the uh, existing income. I think the guy still has like two million plus of carryover losses. I don't think he's going to pay taxes for like a decade. But even with that, when you do this depreciation strategy, how when you sell it, don't you? Don't you lose that anyway? Like, don't, don't you have to pay the taxes at that yeah. point? Yeah. So it's not really bringing the taxes down, it just deferring Slightly. But if you can increase your basis, your tax point is obviously low or diminishing. So if you're going to sell something. So the strategy is to depreciate and increase always the, the, ta the, the basis so that you can, whenever you do end up paying taxes, yeah, because look at look at look at your uh, you know, your basis after your, your mortgage. So you've got the mortgage balance that brings it down. Mm -hmm. Then you've got all the capex that were involved. That's good. All the capital expenditures involved in the project. Depreciation. Um, you know the example is negative. Because that's so you uh, a lot of the expenses are going to be salary oriented. So sometimes. Like, that loss is okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a <laughs> You're still covering yourself, your lifestyle, on the property, it's still what we take. So it's just, it's it looks right. negative just to the tax, on the tax side, but you're, if you're, if you're a public company, so look at your NOI, look at your NOI, that operating income, EGI minus that's your true, that's, that's your your max, you know, trying to maximize your NOI because that's going to be based on your value. Yeah. Yeah. So that after your your NOI is really 
your tax license is going to be kicking in. So I've heard all the tax bill which is going to shut down. It may not look good taxable wise. Like it looks like it's in the law, but overall you're still in the process. Look at our anybody in a developer's tax return. Oh my god, you are the biggest failure. You know, if you look at it from a project level and a Y basis, and all of that's just you know, account of having it's somebody, you know, having a good account. And we'll get into it a little bit, but their the accounting side of it is super commercial, it's very intense. It takes a lot of stuff with somebody who's uh, outside of just gap, but somebody who's really in tune with. Uh, uh, being able to make appropriate project level decisions, whether it's debt, covers obviously great advantages from a time perspective and also from a production to have an accountant, a real estate accountant on as early as possible to help and make decisions in-house or third party. There's a lot of in a lot of these reads specifically they have in-house. They have even have conferences for like read accountants and skills that was actually just like and uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's That's the best way to describe it. Bigger deals, highest tax bracket. Oh, is that 
that's where it's most impactful. Sometimes you'll pay 10 or 15 or 20. Uh, like, that's almost like what it is. What are you doing right now? Like, four, three, go for it. Go for it. You got one and four, three, five. Is it okay? Okay. 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 Or you bring this in? Fancy now. I'm a creator, man. Hey, where you go? Where you go? Where you go? No, if I help build it, I get it for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how that works? No, we got our own over there. Just uh, pull shit together fast. You, build, you build wind farms, man. You should be good when I... That's what I do, bro. <laughs> You got a time crunch, that's the reason I'm not reading the directions. Oh, oh, that probably holds a man. Did you do this? Can you guys see? All right, cool. Got it. Why are you filming? Huh? For you? No, this is for the class. Do y'all see how I did that, though, right? I put that together. Oh, yeah, that looks I'm 
Okay, so Irene is not here, Chad is not here, Juan is not here, Anthony is not here, and Alexander. You're Alexander, that's right. Okay.